All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, if you're, I guess, on the West Coast, it's still morning. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. No matter where you're at in this, on this, on this glorious planet today, it's uh, beautiful and sunny here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody to this week's Cockroach Hour. Um, I, you know, security is a is an important topic. I think for all organizations, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I started my career um, as a developer coding security constructs and. RBAC controls and object libraries and whatnot. And I, I love this topic. I always think of it as kind of one of these, these big topics that um, usually causes a stir and typically something that, uh, you know, people are very stringent about. And, and you have to be good at it, otherwise it fails, right? Because the, the weakest link in your security is only as strong as you are, right? And so I think, you know, this topic is important. Um, you know, we, we spent a fair amount of time here at, at Cockroach Labs thinking about security and, and weaving it into, you know, Cockroach database all over the place. Now, that said, you know, this, this, this is the first time actually in one of these Cockroach hours where we're doing a, a, just a outright navel gazing and looking inside Cockroach DB and talking about security in the context of a database and, and more importantly, a distributed database like Cockroach. So thank you all for joining. Uh, and that's what's, that's what's on the hook for today. Um, but real quick, before I get started, a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a QA panel. Please do ask questions in there. Uh, I like the chat even more. Uh, I have, uh, you know, some of our, our, our sales engineers and some of our technical staff are in there. Um, and so they, they like to engage in chat. Sometimes we get some really, really great chat going on um, back and forth. Uh, and then before you ask, yes, the recording will be available after the event. I know uh, my friend Dan gets it up on our YouTube channel within, oh gosh, I don't want to, I don't want to give an SLA here, but, but it's pretty quick. So, um, but we will make everything available for you all. Um, so today's session is, uh, oh man, I didn't, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't update this. Uh, today's session is intermediate. I say it's intermediate to advance and we aren't going to get into code, but you know, security is never simple. I, I don't think it'd ever be a basic conversation. So people ask us, you know, is this going to be, what kind of session is going to be? So just straight up, we are going to get into you know, we're going to get into VPC pairing, we're going to get into certificates, we're going to get into data encryption, and how we do that in, in Cockroach database. I'm sorry, we're not going to talk about geo partitioning, latency and compliance or code today. I'm sorry, those are the wrong bullets, my bad. Um, but we will be giving away coffee mugs to the best questions. So please do ask your questions. Uh, and, and at the end of this session, I think JP will go through and and choose some of the best questions and, and, and we'll interact with you and, and get coffee mugs out to you. I think they're great actually, I have, I have two of them, they're awesome. So so without further ado, I wanted to thank my uh, distinguished panel for, for joining us. Uh, gentlemen, if you wanna come on video, that'd be great. I wanna see your faces. There's Aaron, there's Tommy, there's Piyush, awesome. Thank you each of you for joining us. Um, I'm honored to have this group today um, you know, this does make up a large portion of, of, of the security brain here at, at Cockroach Labs. And, you know, there's some really intense stuff going on, especially as you secure data. Databases is, is not a simple thing to take care of. And so um, I, I guess if each of you could just introduce yourself. And then I think, you know, I think, you know, I, I told everybody I love security because that's what I started coding. I love it. I think it's cool. Like, I, it's a real kind of geeky topic, but I think it's amazing, actually, because there's somebody always trying to break it, right? Um, but, but why is security important to you? What, who, who you are, what your role is here at Cockroach Lab and, and why is security important to you? I think it'd be a good icebreaker. So Aaron, do you wanna start us off? Sure, um, I'm the lead security engineer. So I get to touch lots of different parts of the process. So that's build pipeline, that's database internals. Um, I get to help work on the SaaS strategy to make sure that we're building something that's, that's going to be consistently secure. Um, and then I even get roped in to help customers with um, how to deploy this in a secure fashion and, and what choices they have as far as making that work. So, and why is security important to you, Aaron? Uh, it's actually just a core passion. It's something that I've been doing for quite a while. And uh, one of the fun parts about Cockroach is you get to see that play out in ways that you wouldn't otherwise in a traditional application because of its scalability and yeah. because of the I way that we- the nature of what we do changes the context of security a fair amount. It, you know, it changes everything. Like. We, we had Andrew Warner on talking about the transactional model. What does it do that, you know, like in security, it's, it, there's a whole bunch of interesting things. So, so Piyush, I know you've been thinking about the, the security areas of, uh, of Cockroach database for quite some, some, quite some time as well. Um, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, I am the lead product manager for our 
operator experience group. So we think about you know all of the operational aspects of your database. Security is obviously a huge part of that. Um, in terms of why security is important to me, um, I mean, I just know how much uh, our customers are trusting us to deliver a product that actually like manages their data, you know, um, keeps it not only alive, but also secure. Uh, so this is all about like, delivering the thing that our customers need, right? Um, and that's why anyone gets into product management, right? So um, it's all about like, hey, like how can we get, um, not only get you to trust, but, like build something that you will trust with your data. Um, so that's that's fundamentally why this is super important to me. Thank you, and thanks for joining us. And I think it's one of those things like we've got to work the way they work. If we don't secure their data, problem. Yep. Like, you, you know, it's like you aren't going to implement a database that's secure, right? So like exactly. And like Aaron said, it's 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 not easy. So I I save the best for last. My favorite product manager in the company. Sorry, I'll just flat out just scoot on. I mean, I was going to say it out here. Dude. Um, so Tommy, do you want to just give a quick introduction as well? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Tommy, a uh, product manager. I joined Cockroach Labs around six months ago. Um, and I work, I got the you know honor to work with Piyush and Aaron on the security side. Um, and I wanted to talk about why security is important from our perspective, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so kind of alluding to what Piyush was saying as a PM, um, you care a lot about impact and how do you get the most, uh, how, how do you help your customers be successful and things like that? And I find that at least in this space, security is one way to unlock a lot of adoption and to get customers to trust and have confidence in using Cockroach DB and Cockroach Cloud to uh, secure and protect their data, manage their data, their workflows, and to run their workloads. And that's exciting because this space is just moving into this new world. It's cloud native, it's distributed. So like, how do we actually make that secure? It's an interesting challenge and it's an interesting problem. So I find it really fun. Yeah, and I think it's a really good point, Tommy. And I, you know, we kind of working off a couple of different things, especially what Aaron said, and a few times for that matter. I mean, doing data, you know, doing security in a database is something that's complex and and not to be you know shorted in terms of the 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 intense like focus that has to be put into that. Um, you know, it's funny when everybody moved to the cloud, they're like, oh, move to the cloud because they have the best practice in security. But then the cloud actually creates issues. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, it creates whole new things. It's funny how people get to the cloud and then they realize, oh my God, I have a whole new, I have a whole new range of things that I have to worry about. So, so let's just talk about just generally as a database, right? So Fuse, as kind of lead product manager of this area, you know, how do you break it down when we start thinking about, you know, the, the, the concepts of security that are important to Cockroach database? Sure. Um, so there's, yeah, there's quite a few different areas that we kind of keep in mind as we're building out our product roadmap and kind of making improvements. Um, so a few things that I can talk about. So, um, you know, it starts with, let's say, encrypting your data at rest, right? Um, so encryption at rest is obviously um, a major feature that we offer to secure your data once it's in Cockroach. We also want to secure all of that data while it's in flight. Um, so connecting to your database securely, um, connecting uh, nodes, new nodes to your cluster and, and properly um, you know, authenticating them to join the cluster, uh, encrypting the traffic that's flowing in between nodes. Um, there's also role-based access controls, right? So I know, Jim, that's something that you mentioned you worked on. Um, that's that's something that we're building out. We have to consider things like, um, you know, what's our story with compatibility with Postgres? Um, you know, uh, what types of controls are we offering? Are we making privileges that are, are fine-grained enough that, um, you know, our users aren't giving away too many permissions when they need to get someone to do something in their database? Um, let's see what else. There's also encrypted backup and restore, right? So how is the, the data that's in your cluster being securely um, stored elsewhere so that, you know, if, if the worst happens, you're able to recover. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a, a ton of topics. And I know um, Aaron and, and Tommy probably have even more that they could mention. I'm sure I missed a few there, but those are just uh, a few of the ones that I can uh, I can speak to, at least that we've worked on recently. Right. And I think, you know, as you move to the cloud, Tommy, you and I have talked a lot about, there's even added things that come with like a SaaS implementation, right? Yeah, right. Um, if you're referring to Cockroach Cloud or manage uh, offering. Um, that's something we're trying to push along, get it out to market and help make that easy for uh, customers out there. Um, we talk about things like, oh, sorry, Jim. No, 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 you were just going oh. there. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I was gonna talk about like, for example, one of the new things we are including in Cockroach Cloud is how do you uh, securely connect to your clusters? We have new offerings around VPC pairing for GCP yeah. clusters. Um, down the line, we're gonna do AWS private link uh, to connect to your AWS apps as well. So like, these are a few examples of things that we're kind of pushing the needle on. 
And we'll, and we'll talk about all those today. I mean, I think, I think it is going to be really interesting, y'all, when we get to multi-tenant as well. Um, you know, seeing a multi-tenant database deployed in the cloud, serverless, like what does the world of security mean in this cert all serverless? I, I, I'm not a really big fan of the word, the, the word y'all, but, you know, I, I can't wait to be able to talk through all that with you guys. I think that's going to be really a lot of fun to think through because there's, it gets into wholly other, wholly other aspects. And so, Aaron, I want to actually turn it to you because I think your your background in terms of your deep knowledge of security, you, you've been in the security game for really quite some time. And, you know, kind of what we were just talking about, like this, the, the concept of distributed systems adds a ripple to the challenge of, of what, what, what it means to be a secure database. Like, what, what do you feel like the biggest challenges that distributed systems adds to, um, you know, to the security stuff in, 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 you know, in, this, type, in this type of deployment? So I think main thing with the distributed system is you want it to be available and you want to make sure everything can communicate as it needs to. Right. And often security is making sure that unauthorized parties are not communicating or accessing things. So there's a fundamental push and pull there. And I think our solution to that has been quite good and that we've worked to make sure the nodes have very strong trust between them. Um, we have MTLS and that means that not only is a node sure that it's communicating with other nodes that are part of that trusted hierarchy, but it itself can actually use that same trust anchor to validate itself to those nodes. So it's, it's a web of trust that's just as resilient as the underlying data structures. Yeah. So it's almost, you got to think about it in the distributed environment. It's a web. It's not synchronous communication between two endpoints. I mean, what you're talking about is a many to many relationship and, and, you know, I, I don't know. I've been in the Kubernetes space too for quite a while, Aaron, and, and it just seems like security gets in the way, right? And it, and it is painful, right? And so, you know, what are the things that we, you know, what do you, what do you feel like? How do you make it simple, right? How, what do you do? Because like, and I, I only ask because like, look, yeah, we're talking about cockroach, but like, I think there's a lot of distributed systems people on the phone as well, right? And so, you know, like, what's the best practice to think about, that, right? So today we're looking at a couple of ways of doing it for Kubernetes. Um, Internal to our managed offering, we orchestrate all the certificate management and all the trust primitives. So like we have our own system that handles that, but realize that might not be satisfying. And um, we do have ways for you to do it. You can treat them all as independent nodes and then store things within uh, like Kubernetes secrets. But um, actually last night, I spent a fair bit of time uh, working back and forth with Ben, uh, trying to refine where we're going. and. We're looking at an approach that will allow nodes to behave as first tenants within the Kubernetes sets. So they'll come up, you'll pass them an initialization and just say, hey, you're a, you're a CockroachDB node set. And they'll be able to pair with each other, share a secret, and then come online. And any, any resources like user CAs and things that you want to anchor to will be provisioned to them. And it'll, make, it'll figure out the rest as it goes. So it'll go from, you have to orchestrate it to, uh, you turn it on and it pretty much just works and behaves in an internally consistent and secure fashion. And is that done natively in Cockroach or is that something that's being like we use an operator to do that? I, what, what do you think, Aaron? How's that, how does that get implemented, right? Because again, look, if we're doing it for a database, I hope there's people on the phone who are doing it for whatever application they're building and there's a best practice pattern, here, right? So we're trying to put as much of that into the application layer as possible yeah. to relieve the load from Kubernetes. Because anything that you put into an operator starts to become a little bit more unusual or you have steps and you wind up with, especially in a distributed system, the issue of, okay, well, who comes up first and who initializes things if you have dozens or even thousands of nodes coming up? Like who's in charge and why do you trust that node and what happens if that node fails? So we really wanted to take an approach where the database itself had the resiliency to build the security structures in a similar fashion to the way it builds the other um, distributed components. So, yeah. Like, I think some of the same concepts we use within the database itself in terms of how it actually communicates. I mean, we're using things like gossip and that sort of stuff. I mean, it's basically, we're just living on top of the already great communication we're doing between nodes, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually one of the things we're going to do for provisioning or we're looking at doing where after the nodes establish that they all belong to the same group, they'll be able to share all the rest of the configuration information underneath secure uh, comp patterns using the underlying data structs. That's cool. You guys just think I'm a product marketing guy. You guys think I'm in marketing. I'm telling you, boys, this is the stuff right here. I love it. All right, so um, so I think like I think the Kubernetes thing is is going to be interesting. I think one of the other challenges within Kubernetes, and guys, I'm a little bit off the talk. I'm going to hit number two for a second. Um, you know, and, and Tommy, this kind of touched on some of the stuff you were talking about as well.
well and certificates and all this stuff. I find, you know, in Kubernetes in particular and in deployments, um, certificates can be a problem, right? It, it's, it is a challenge, right? How do we deal with kind of certificate management with Cockroach TV? How do you see customers doing this? I don't, I don't know, any, any, I, Aaron, you, you were out there, Fuchs, I don't know. Who, who wants to jump in and kind of answer that? I can take that one. So you can lead engineer. So today uh, we support really robust security controls around certs. You can use different trust anchors or CAs for the nodes communicating with each other. You can use different ones for authenticating users coming into the system. Um, and you can also put your own certificates or allow the um, system to use self-signed ones for communicating to those ports. So depending on your deployment strategy, you may need to use an external uh, CA to mint certificates for all of your internal services. That's fine, we support that. If you're just doing a dev environment and you mint your own certs, you can do that too. So it, it provides that sort of granular access control. Right, but I mean, typically Aaron, these things are involved. Right? It's not simple to actually set up, get configured, deal with it, right? Like, what have we done to basically simplify that too? Or are we just going down that path? I know we work with that stuff, right? I, I don't think we'd have been able to survive without working with it, right? Like what have we done to simplify it as well? So today we are pretty well supported if you have the ability to orchestrate your own certificate story. Okay. Um, getting started is a little bit more, a little bit more friction and we're actively working on improving that. Um, there's, Again, going back to the Kubernetes thing we talked about before, where we're looking at being able to bring the nodes up and have them automatically communicate and gossip the other trust primitives, we're looking at doing the same thing for manual or scripted deployed solutions. So the nodes would actually be able to generate an internode communication web with their own CA. It would not be externally exposed, it's, it's opaque. Um, so the nodes will be using strong TLS, um, which the user doesn't have to manage at all anymore. Um, and for everything else, if you want to set an, a, a certificate that you've signed or that you trust, you can do that. And that's just a matter of putting the right certificates with the right names in the right config paths or directories. Right, so how does that, how does that work, Aaron? I'm sorry to, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by this actually. Um, and I'm trying to ask the question to get into it a little bit deeper. When you think about a TLS connection, right? There is some sort of certificate exchange between two nodes that actually have that conversation. How does that work? I mean, is it, is it a public key that then we use a symmetric key to do that? Like, how, how does, I guess I'm asking kind of how TLS works a little bit, right? No, not at all. Um, so as it works today, each node gets a certificate to its own host name that's issued by a common CA. The public key for that CA is also installed in the certificates directory for right. each node. So the nodes can validate each other's certificates and represent themselves with signed certificates to be able to establish MTLS um, and mutually authenticate across the web. Right. So then basically we're using this typical, you know, public private key infrastructure that's been around for a long time and proven um, to, to establish secure communication between the nodes, right? So I guess that picks the first part off, right? Secure data in motion, right? I mean, wasn't that one of your key things, Piyush, right? So are there, is there anything else we have to do to secure data in motion? Well, we've got the auth picture. <laughs> Need to make sure that we're talking to the right people. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's that's actually like a, a pretty large area. It's deceptively large, right? Because there's all sorts of like external external integrations that people want supported. Um, so, you know, there's authentication and authorizations that every user will have when they're talking to your database. Um, so, you know, there's existing systems, right? Like Active Directory and, and Kerberos and all of these other tools um, that people want to use because they centralize authentication, you know, throughout their entire company, right? So especially large companies, large enterprises will want to have a single central place where they manage all the permissions for their users. And, you know, if um, someone joins or leaves the company, they just have to work in that one place instead of like going through and provisioning accounts for them and like every single internal service that they, they provide. Um, so that's something that we're actually working on. So um, we do, for example, support, uh, you know, Perberos integrations for authentication. Um, we're kind of laying the groundwork, um, a lot of doing a lot of the security work to um, enable authorizations as well. So um, authorizations meaning what privileges users actually have inside of, inside of the database, right? Um, so, I mean, that's on the database side. We also have, you know, this wonderful packaged uh, admin UI that ships with our database. Um, and there we're working on things like single sign-on that's actually coming in our 20.2 release. So, um, you know, uh, again, right, it's that story of you don't want to have to create um, a, a username and password for every single user that's accessing your database. You just want to use some central, you know, uh, OAuth provider, right, uh, to allow people to access their, their admin UI and see what's happening inside of their cluster. 
Um, so like properly authenticating and authorizing users is, uh, is definitely like a huge area that security covers like cockroach. And we coverized the cluster, I think it was two releases ago, right? Two, was that, I think something like that, right? And then yep. Active Directory came in, I think the last one, and now you're talking SSO, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so yep. I think it's a pretty clear like path that we're headed down towards basically making this work the way that others work. I think Tommy, you talked about that as well, it's kind of the very beginning. Um, there's other types of connections though. Uh, and, and again, let's, well, we'll just round out this whole section with VPC peering, right? So, Tommy, I think we're adding, we added VPC peering over the summer, right? I think with AWS, now with GCP, right? So just explain to me what it is and like, what, what's the state of, of that project now? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what we tend to find is that a lot of our customers, they tend to uh, run their apps in their own virtual private uh, networks. And, you know, one of the challenges that we had with uh, Cockroach Cloud in the beginning was the fact that you know, how, how do you how do you connect to those other VPCs in your uh, cloud provider? We didn't really have a way to do that. So what we ended up seeing were a lot of customers allow listing the public internet to allow traffic between cockroaches, uh, clusters, and their applications. Like that works, um, seamless UX, you can say, but it's not actually secure from their perspective. It's not actually desirable from what they need. So we heard this come up a lot and a lot from all of our Cockroach Cloud customers. And yeah, over the summer, we were able to uh, bake in support for VPC peering over GCP. And uh, you do the same thing with AWS clusters, um, but you know, doing it using their private link endpoint uh, stack. So that that's currently in a process right now. And actually just today, we enabled VPC peering for all Cockroach Cloud customers. So that's available for all uh, folks using Cockroach Cloud today. Um, the private link self-service UI, that's gonna be coming down uh, later this year, but we're excited to get that out soon for, for people. Awesome, so congratulations. I know that was a bit of a labor of love to get that out there, um, but it's basically, it's just configurable via the admin UI in Cockroach Cloud now, correct? I'm sorry? Is it configurable just in the admin UI now in Cockroach Cloud, right? Yeah, Cockroach Cloud and the UI. So uh, I feel like the, the big point to hit there too is this is kind of like you know a challenge that people have, um, especially with you know modern cloud deployments, right? Where um, you know IP whitelisting is is or IP allow listing, I should say, is challenging because you are no longer running your application on you know something that has a fixed IP address. Um, so like if you're orchestrating your application, right? Like you're killing pods, bringing them up based on on um, you know the volume of requests that are coming into your application. Um, you're going to have new IP addresses coming in and out of existence, right? And trying to connect to your cockroach clusters. Like, how do you know which ones you should allow to connect to your cluster? Right. Um, and like, it's kind of that new modern infrastructure is kind of driving this need for peering, which I think is kind of uh, interesting to see. Yep. Yeah, and it's, um, it's, I think it's a unique challenge. Well, it's actually not a unique challenge for us as a database. I think lots of applications are dealing with this and this complexity. And this is kind of one of those new things like, hey, I move to the cloud and like all of a sudden I get there. And what the, what, what, what else? I, what, I got a bunch of other stuff I have to take care of now, right? So it's a pretty good example of that. So, so let's, I, I actually want to go back a little bit, um, Piyush, and, and we, you know, yeah I, yeah, I love our back, okay? I don't know why. And, and I'm going to, there's a question here about audit as well. So, you know, there's the whole triple A of, 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 of security, right? There's authentication, authorization, and, is it auditability, accounting, uh, whatever, logging and got right? Um, so when we talk about RBAC and rules-based access control, you know, we talked a little bit about authenticating user, but the authorization part and that thing, we, we put that into core in the spring, correct? It was like, what, what led you to that decision? Because, you know, I, I quite like how, I, I like it when features get into our, you know, we, we do run an open core business model. So what, what got you there? For sure. Um, yeah. And, you know, to set some context, we kind of have like a rough rule of thumb that we follow for which features we think should fall into like the open core part of our product versus the you know, commercially licensed part of our product, which is, um, do we think it's, it's useful to startups or do we think it's something that's more useful to like sophisticated enterprise customers? Right. Um, historically, we kind of thought that 
rule-based access controls were more of the latter, right? Um, like you need very sophisticated access controls when you have an organization that's like hundreds or thousands of people. Um, but I think what we ended up finding was actually there's a, a huge Postgres compatibility story here. Um, so actually like the way Postgres treats um, roles and users, it actually treats them interchangeably. Um, and in order to support that concept of kind of making users and roles interchangeable uh, to match you know, Postgres syntax, to support um, external tools that rely on Postgres syntax, so things like ORMs and uh, you know, different like application frameworks, um, we actually ended up realizing, okay, well, we have to um, essentially make this role-based access control stuff uh, fall into the, the open core part of our product because otherwise it's just gonna break a lot of these integrations. So in order to, you know, to make the user experience better for um, basically everyone who's connecting into the database, uh, we decided it was just, it just made more sense to put this into the open core part of the product. Honestly, I think security is a baseline. Like you can't do, like you can't build an app without some sort of foundation security. Like, I don't, I don't care if you're building a simple like birthday app. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like a to-do list. There, there's just a concept of security I find to be incredibly important. And maybe it's just because I've been in the security space for so long, but you know, or well, at least tangential to it, you know, related. I'm no Aaron, but you know what I mean? I, I at least care about this stuff. So. Um, but I think, you know, making it part of core of Fuse was, you know, something that we talked about at the last release and I don't think it was very well understood. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not just for the enterprise, it's for every single company, startup, okay. you know, obvious. And then I think the whole concept of being, you know, this compatible with, with, with Postgres and, you know, being wire compatible and what does wire compatible actually mean? Well, there's a whole context of this that, that becomes really, really important. So, um, Cool, thanks for that, Yush, I really appreciate it. The, 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 I wanna shift a little bit from the data in motion, which I think that was kind of where we're at. Like, I think we did data in motion, a little bit around the internet. Let's talk a little bit about data at rest as well. And there's two sides of this, right? So, you know, encrypting data at rest, uh, and then kind of, you know, there's the backup of the store. So let's just talk about the encryption at rest. How does that work today um, within Cockroach database? Because right? I know we can do that. At what level can we do that? Who, who wants to pick that one off? Aaron, I, I see Aaron going for the mute button. I'm like, I mean, I had the mute button already off. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so, like, you know, you can kind of tell when people are like, ah, I'll talk about it. So I can't, I can't speak too deeply about this. I know that we actually just shifted our storage engine. Um, we went from RocksDB to Pebble mm -hmm. and um, I remember the PR for that because we basically evicted a bunch of the old C++ code that enabled RocksDB uh, to do encryption at rest and replaced it with our own uh, Pebble engine. But I can't, right. go, I can't go deep into the weeds. What I can say though is all the nodes, if configured to use encryption at rest, will write encrypted data and only encrypted data to the data stores on disk. Right. So. And it's all configurable, right? So I mean, uh, at what layer can you actually configure encryption at rest? Is it the whole database? Is it a table? Is it a row? Is it a column, right? Like it's, as far as I know, it's at the entire cluster level today. Yeah. Um, and we've heard requests for um, things like row level or column level security and, and controls around that. Um, and that's definitely something that we're looking at long-term, but it's definitely like the whole, the whole cluster today. We can't do this basically a column at this point. Take an Aussie cage or a piece of data, right? Not yet, no. Okay, cool. Well, I think it's just what a roadmap's for. Yep. Um, what about data? You know, what about when we do integrations with CDC? Does it, I mean, is it something to the CDC capabilities that we have that are encrypting, or is it basically whatever we're feeding into CDC is encrypted? That's a great question. Actually, Aaron, do you know? I know we've done a little bit of work on that recently. I don't know if you're familiar. I, I don't know the current state, and I don't want to misrepresent it. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Um, I will, uh, I, there was a question, Samir, thank you for asking the question. Uh, I'm trying to work through questions in a long time. Um, I, 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 you know, every, every one of these practice hours, at one point I say, wow, Jesse Seldes and team does an amazing team with our documentation. So um, if, if we weren't able to answer it here, I'm fairly certain that our docs will have an answer for you on this. And they're pretty, they're pretty well searchable. And you know, the, the Slack channel is actually a really good place to engage and you'll get engineers actually answering on these sort of things as well. So, um, so, so 
before I get into, there is another also a question about recovery and master keys. You should, let's talk about like backup and restore, right? So backup and restore in distributed systems is not simple, right? And then encrypted backup and restore also not simple. It, it, it's compounding, right? Mm -hmm. What are the complexities? Yeah, I mean, um, I know one thing that we've been thinking about recently is how we can integrate with um, like external secret managers, right? So like um, AWS KMS, right? Um, so you probably don't want to be in the business of like managing the complexity of dealing with all these keys and like rotating all that stuff and um, doing all of that by hand or like scripting it. So there's just, you know, external tools that are built to, to handle all that stuff. And, and now it's kind of on cockroach, like, okay, if we see our customers are using these things, which is, you know, the security best practice, how can we support them and make sure that they're successful? So actually, um, we have started laying the groundwork for support of uh, AWS KMS, right? Um, so that, you know, all the secure uh, backup stuff kind of happens without you having to get way into the weeds of it um, and just making it way more hands off and easier to use. Um, so that's kind of the thing that's, that's top of mind right now. Um, obviously, we do support um, enc encrypted backups uh, and uh, restoring from those backups. So I think that was something we added relatively recently. I don't remember the exact release off the top of my head. Um, Is that an enterprise feature for you? Sure, that's not anymore, right? I mean, because we're, we're moving some of our backup restore features into, into core of this, this release, correct? That is correct. Um, I don't think that is part of the, the, the piece that's moving to core. Um, enterprise, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is something that's super exciting for 20.2 is um, we've, we've definitely heard a ton of requests for like, hey, like, can we get the distributed backup in, into the core part of our product? So we're really excited to be making that change. And distributed backup, I, it's one of these things that I just, I guess I didn't really get it. I thought we just did it naturally, but it's actually not simple to do, right? Because in our database, we can actually do something called geo partition, which is you know, tied to its locations. If you're going to do a backup and you have some sort of policy about that you're meeting some compliance or regulation thing because data needs to live in Germany, right? like what, you know, whatever that is, like customer data needs to reside in certain places. If you just did a backup restore of the entire cluster and that went to like one central repository, you have just violated all that policy. Yep. So, and then that actually, the trick is restoring as well, right? Right. Exactly. It's like, hey, something, something happens. I need to also restore this in such a way that the data never leaves the specific geographic region. That's super tricky. It's just not That's, simple. It's like, it's one of these concepts of the distributed systems where you just think, oh, oh, wait, oh, wait, that's actually, and then you get into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was actually the biggest snag we hit when we first started exploring the AWS, uh, you know, KMS, because we're like, okay, well, we'll just generate keys. Oh, wait, we're going to need different keys for the different regions because we don't want one region to be able to decrypt the backups. Okay, we're going to need to send these to different regions, and they're going to need to have different keys. But do we keep a master key for that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it was a really uh, interesting problem, and I, I don't know, ex I don't know where it currently is. But watch this space because we're definitely working on making sure that we can preserve the integrity of that data as well as the privacy. Yeah, it's just, it's just to me, it's just one of these things you guys that like in even distributed systems. Like everything old is new again, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, because we have some of these things in Postgres, that MySQL and Oracle, and everybody like doing it distributed. It, it just adds a layer of complexity, which I think is actually pretty important. One of the other questions that came up and why we're still talking about kind of encryption and this sort of thing. Um, when will we be able to mass data in Cockroach? I don't think we can do it today. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like. Is that something that's on the on the roadmap, Hughes? That is something we've heard requests for. Um, we're definitely looking at it, um, but we we don't have any immediate plans to support data masking yet. Um, okay. So we're kind of still in the early requirements gathering phase for that. And I think right now, Aaron, what we're seeing is organizations they kind of do it around a deployment architecture. What they like, and it's basically the entirety of the database is what they're securing away for those purposes. Correct? Yeah, for now. It ends up being kind of in that in that part of the world. So, um, so thank you. That that's really good, you guys. So there was another question, and, and actually it was something that I wanted to talk about as well. You know, you usually talked about integrating with you know like authorization frameworks and these sort of things. There's also alerting and monitoring when it comes to security, and there's a whole suite of tools out there that allow you to, to understand what's going on. I mean, from Splunk to I don't know somebody in their knock and yeah, you know, whatever, right? Like. What what is what does Cockroach implement on that side of the world? And let's just start with let's just start with alerting, and we'll come back to logging. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, we're actually starting to build out some partnerships in that in that space. Um, so we are kind of looking at what external vendors we want to support. Um, in terms of pure monitoring, obviously we're starting to build out, um, you know, kind of uh, metric-based monitoring support with, um, you know, companies like uh, Elastix Kibana, right, um, Datadog. Uh, so they'll be able to scrape our Prometheus endpoint, ingest metrics, um, and then we can configure alerts on top of that. Um, in terms of security alerting, I would I would expect most of that to be through logging. So we are looking at companies like Splunk, right? Um, how can we better integrate with them? Um, how can we, this is starting to get into logs already, format our logs that they're easy to ingest there. It's all related, right? So it is, it is. Um, yeah, so it, it's kind of that question of like, okay, how can we feed these tools with the proper data? Um, so, you know, to that end, we're starting to generate um, kind of these trails, these audit logs of all the different actions users are taking in the database, right? So things like um, when are users provisioning new accounts? When are they granting those accounts permissions? Um, when are people connecting and authenticating to the database? When are they connecting and failing to authenticate? Um, so all of those events we actually track and store um, into you know, audit logs or uh, we have an event log that tracks things like schema changes and other things like that. Um, and then ideally you would feed that into some external tool, which would then be able to monitor uh, on, on top of these events. Yeah, and then doing it in real time, Piyush, mm -hmm. um, is this something that's, you know, are you scraping the Prometheus endpoint? I mean, because I think that's what people are also interested in, right? Like I think there's, like there's the forensic side of it, which is like, yeah, I don't know, it seems people use Splunk for years doing that kind of stuff, right? But there's the real time thing too. How does that work right now? Yeah, um, so this is kind of veering into intrusion detection systems. And I know this is something that Aaron is actually very passionate about. So mm -hmm. I will actually kick this over to him. Go on, so Aaron. today, So today uh, we have a number of logs and you can configure what goes into the audit logging. Uh, we found that that's fine for customers that know exactly what they want to audit. Um, but we're actually working on aligning things to a security specific log sync so that you can have a security log that's emitted and monitored directly. And then you'll get that at right time. So the log will continue to just spill to disk today uh, we're looking at ways to actually feed, feed that to a network sync or something else. Um, but once that's done, you'll have a fairly high fidelity feed of all the security events from the cluster. Um, do all databases do it like this, Aaron? Not in my experience. It's sort of a, a grab bag, depending on who wrote what where, whether right. you're going to get a pure security log or whether you're going to have to go pick through a lot of other noisy events and try to isolate the things that actually matter to you. So we're yeah. trying to make it very, very digestible. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah, so the, the intrusion thing is actually, a, it's also in my heart too, huge because sure, I coded RBAC frameworks, but I also worked at a company called Vontu, which was a DLP, data loss prevention. And that, that, man, that, was, that was a fun space. So identifying you know, data as it flows out of the network and data mask, all this stuff actually come together. And so like I said, everything old is new again um, because there's these different kind of issues that we deal with in distributed systems, right? So. Um, that's cool. I think I've gotten through all the questions that we had here. Um, and then I think we, we actually talked about the last one too, Tommy. You talked a fair amount about you know, what have we learned in Cockroach Cloud. Beyond VPC peering, is there anything else we've learned in deploying Cockroach as a service ourselves that kind of, that, that might be a best practice for people to think about as they deploy their any applications? I don't know, Tommy or Aaron? I'm noodling through right now, but Aaron, if you want to jump in, feel free to. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say if you have VPCs, try to connect with that. We highly encourage you from um, uh, connecting your traffic through the open internet. But on that topic, there is a conversation of this uh, free tier of Cockroach Cloud that's coming up that's being worked on by the team. And one of our requirements there is, you know, let's simplify that UX. If, um, you know, if free tier customers aren't able to connect to their VPCs right now, but we want to remove that ability for them to, or to require them to allow list IPs in order to connect, like, how can we improve the security posture of Cockroach Cloud, you know, by default to help them connect there entirely. Um, so, so there are things that are happening behind the scenes to enable that. And I don't know, Aaron, if you wanted to kind of like hone in on some of the details there, sure. if we're so allowed to talk about it. Well, I'll talk about it from a logging standpoint because it's actually one of the places that really highlighted um, like 
as, as I looked at trying to secure Cockroach Cloud and make sure that we were protecting our customers' data, um, I realized that picking through all of the emitted log messages was very, very high volume. And anybody that's worked with a, a you know, enterprise team knows that they tend to charge you either by volume or by lines. And I didn't want to adjust all the lines from the database. I wanted just the security events. So going back to that, I started getting requirements around and you know, development work around getting just that security feed, which we can then build models of what's normal and what's not. And so instead of forcing customers to use an allow list or asking them to take you know, specific VPC actions, we're gonna put, put controls in place that would allow us to identify bad actors that are probing the infrastructure and reject them or limit them and allow customers to continue to interact without feeling the pain of those additional security controls. So, yeah, so don't get in their way, just make it work, right? That's right. It should just work. It should just work. And I think that's the trick with security. When it just works, nobody even notices it. It's, it goes under underappreciated, but it's actually really awesome. So um, kudos to you and the team, Aaron, because I think it's a lot of, it's, it's some really kind of elegant work going on in that, in that side. And you had referenced Ben earlier, Ben Darnell, one of our founders, probably one of the, I don't know you all, like probably one of the single best engineers I've ever met in my life. He's brilliant. And so these are, these are not easy things to solve. Uh, and to do it kind of uh, elegantly. So are there one other question. So do we have any plans to integrate with Linux security groups and users? Um, do you... That's a good question. I actually haven't heard that request to right. date. Um, so we don't have any plans yet, uh, but actually if, if you're willing to file a GitHub issue, I would, I would happily follow up there. That's right. And we are open. Uh, and then I guess, you know, we use asymmetric encryption. What does that mean? Who wants to take, I'll take that? Aaron, I'll take a shot at answering this one. Um, I don't know the exact context that's being quoted from, but uh, all the PKI work that we do is asymmetric crypto. So if you want to authenticate to the cluster using certificates, you're not sharing a symmetric key that can be compromised in both places. It's you have one end and that authenticates you. Um, you have your private key, and then through a standard key exchange, you'll establish secure communications using TLS. Yep. And I think just looking up how how you know, PK infrastructure works um, helps people understand how these how asymmetric encryption works. I think it's truly awesome. Right? You know, so I'll go way back, you guys. Uh, again, I got to give a little shout out to my my history, man. Like we had implemented SHA one MD five and embedded a hundred and twenty eight bit symmetric key into the BIOS of the machine. Uh, all within about 25k of code, so that you can actually take that, that that symmetric key, which you were guaranteed what that was, and actually implement public key infrastructure from the BIOS up into the OS, uh, which I thought was pretty damn cool. That was that was some, again, remarkable engineering, but that was symmetric, but it allowed us to do asymmetric eventually. So it, it, there's some really cool stuff and, and a lot of good reading out there um, for the person who asked the question. I, that does it's a wonderful topic to go down. Um, cause it's, it's super interesting and really, really cool. So, well, y'all, I think we covered everything. Um, we covered all the concepts that you should kind of outline at the beginning. I think we hit all the questions. There was one question was like, can we, can we, can we, can we install the admin UI, uh, separate from, you know, our cloud cluster, whatever that is. Um, I think the person who asked this question, um, you know, Dietrich, uh, the admin UI comes with every node of cockroach, uh, every node of cockroach is a is one atomic unit. There's no different types of node. There's no admin node, and a, a, a storage node, and a transaction node. It's, just, it's a node is a node is a node. It comes with all of the security. It comes with all of our UI. It comes with all of the CLI. It comes with all of the CDs. Like, like the binary is the binary. Uh, interesting enough, connecting to our admin UI, you can connect to any node and you have access to the admin UI, which is just awesome, right? And, Talk about key concepts in distributed systems, right? And, and being, you know, living up to those primitives, you know, that single atomic unit being the, the full context of our, of our software, single binary. And so it is really what allows us to scale very easily. You know, just spin up, you know, you point it at the cluster, as long as you have a TLS connection, you're good, right? So yeah, think, that was actually one of the challenges on the Kubernetes side, because since all the nodes are the same, yeah. it's not like you bring up a master and then you, you bring up a bunch of you know, ancillary nodes. It's like all the nodes come up, they're all the same. There's nothing to differentiate them, which when you're trying to establish the trust primitives that build the entire Kubernetes set, how do you pick one? 
or do you pick one? So. We, we solve that, Aaron, right, inside code. So I think that's one of those things. And again, it comes back to these, you know, as you're building out distributed systems, you're going down these paths trying to figure it out in, in your own applications. This is one of those things about being an open source company and contributing back to the community and, 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 and putting our code into public repos where people can actually go and investigate this stuff and see a best practice, which to me, you know, I, I get these conversations about open source all the time, you know, like, uh, license, license, like, well, there's also a whole bunch of code and like incredible software engineering that's out there. And I think this is one of those areas that, uh, you know, this is, this is cockroach giving, giving back to the world as well. Um, and from some great minds on our team. So, um, and again, I was, you know, always going to the docs. So, um, so with that, uh, let's see, there's, uh, let's see here, there's one more possible to disable the root user inside cockroach and have different admin to connect to the cluster. I, I can take that one. Yeah, can you, Aaron? That'd be great. So, yeah, give, so just, just repeat the, just paraphrase the question really quick. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, cockroach TV has a special root user that is used for doing certain cluster administration events. It is a very special user and by default does not have a password set. Um, you can only use a certificate to authenticate as it. Um, it's, it's basically a very special maintenance account. Um, at some point in the future, I would like to see that disappear and become a named admin account that can be anything that you want. But today it is a special account. We do not recommend using it for anything outside of cluster administration. And we have a new slew of permissions, I think landing in 20.2, they'll actually make it easier to administer clusters with named users that are not that special user. It's also worth mentioning that we do have a dedicated admin role that does give you um, like a select you know, slew of admin privileges. So you can grant the admin role to a user that you want to run a lot of these administrative commands um, and then not have to use the root user. And all pretty well documented. Um, yeah, I mean, very, very well documented. And just again, just did a great job. So. I think you can also potentially put a, a line in for uh, the host based auth to prevent remote. Uh, access to the root role. So you would have to be local to the device with the certificate to be able to authenticate. So uh, one last thing, I guess, Aaron, you talked a little bit about this before. Are there different levels of auditing within Cockroach? I mean, I think you're, you know, we're kind of building that in now, right? Uh, absolutely. So you have everything from the security auditing that we were talking about earlier, all the way down to every query and every transaction is audited. So depending on your level of granularity, your mileage might vary if you turn on audit everything that the database does, because that's that's going to be a lot of I/O, but it, it's available to you and it's tunable. Okay. And then actually, this I'm gonna have, this is my favorite topic. And this this is uh, Alex Robinson shout out. Um, if you're running two clusters in OpenShift and you want to connect them, how do you do that? This is you know, shift out OpenShift for Kubernetes, right? So like. Yeah, multiple, you know, federated clusters, right, Aaron? I mean, this is not a simple thing to do. Um, and how do you connect nodes within Cockroach, which is actually a different layer, right? Now we're, we're not talking about a federated cluster. We're just actually federating data now at the database level. How does that work? I know we have a we have a pretty good video about this. I think Alex Robinson had done for us a while ago. Do you, do you know how that works, Aaron? No, I can't speak to that. Yeah. I will say one super nice thing is actually we just had a Kubernetes operator that was OpenShift certified uh, right. that will be available on that actually I think is available now on the Red Hat Marketplace. Yeah. Um, so one super simple answer is user operator. <laughs> well, yeah, user operator to deploy in OpenShift. And I think the, the complexities of doing multi-region uh, applications on top of Kubernetes is not simple. I, we're doing it in the cloud team today. Um, so I think the easiest way to get that done is to actually go use Cocker Cloud. How's that for commercial use? Good. Lakshmi will be happy with me. So, all right, you guys. So listen, thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for taking the time today. That was that was really really helpful. Um, actually, learned a fair amount today. So I, I I miss our lunches together, you guys. I, I miss sitting around and having these conversations because it's you learn more about the company that way than anything. So. Um, but but great work and, and thank you all for joining and thank everybody for joining us today. And there was a lot of really good questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope it was helpful for everybody. Um, again, the recording will be up and available. Um, there is a survey after this event as well that JP will put in front of everybody. Um, please do uh, complete that. It really helps us get better. Um, uh, and any and all the feedback is, is just really wonderful. So, all right, shall we all say goodbye? 
All right, guys. One is Aaron. See you, buddy. Thank you. Tommy. See you, Tommy. Piyush, we'll see you later, buddy. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.